thank you very much for sticking around. I'll, uh, I'll be as brief as possible to make up for lost time, like a video on airplanes. So uh, it's still a very it's a lot of pleasure for me to be here, and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, a new development in the way we, we've been thinking in the lab. So traditionally we've been uh, studying object recognition, uh, visual recognition, and uh, expanded to visual cognition, uh, broadly speaking. How is it that we understand the visual environment around us and uh, so that we can interact uh, and navigate our, uh, our way around? And in recent uh, decade or so, we started also thinking about future in the brain. How is it that the brain thinks uh, about what's coming next? What are the, what's, what's likely to happen in the next uh, second, the next millisecond, the next uh, minutes, the next days, etc. So how is it that we create uh, um, future in the brain? And it starts by, by uh, looking at once you realize, you know, once enough, um, enough years have passed after the graduate school, you understand that you've been uh, implicitly uh, learning that cognition and perception are two different entities in the brain. There's perception, the cortex that does the basic stuff about the physical input, uh, analyzing lines, texture, colors, etc. And once perception ends at doing it, it, it's staying, only then cognition kicks in. Only then cognition. So there's like different courses for perception and cognition, especially in psychology, but also in neuroscience. And we think about this as two, two entities that are almost not talking with each other. And the more we think about it, I think it's, a, it's actually a well-accepted uh, development right now that actually this boundary between perception and cognition is pretty artificial, pretty arbitrary, and the brain is not as, as reactive as we've been led to think, and it's not that it's just sitting there waiting to be uh, activated by the senses, but rather it's more actively trying to understand the environment and not necessarily in a waiting mode. Uh, and we know that, that one uh, manifestation of this is the fact that most, if not all, connections in the brain are reciprocal. They go in both directions. Uh, but the problem is that it's not an intuitive thought. Uh, uh, the brain, like our brain, our minds like to think about hierarchies, about some kind of, of a flow, a cascade of information flow. And therefore, even though we all know that these connections are reciprocal, you open the most recent textbook and all the lines there are still unidirectional. They go from primary cortex, in this case, uh, in the visual cortex, they go from primary cortex forward. So we know that this connection is going both directions, but it's just hard to absorb and how to bring this into mainstream thinking about how the brain works. So that's one thing, trying to uh, demolish this boundary between perception and cognition by thinking more uh, 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 dominantly about uh, reciprocation and feedback and feed forward working together. And it's not that feedback is there only to help us in extreme cases, uh, uh, etc. The second thing that uh, we try to modify in the way we think is that, especially the problem of object recognition, uh, uh, the dogma there again is that we look at an object and, we, and the brain asks or try to solve the, the problem, the question of what is this, what is this in front of us by analyzing the elements of this picture um, meticulously. But what we've suggested recently, or not so recently, is to modify this question and think about the brain as asking what is this like. And it looks like a, a minor semantic uh, difference, but it actually is a functional difference. And, and looking at the recognition problem more is uh, analogy making, looking at continuously uh, taking things from memory and from input and then comparing and, and having memory play as a more central role in perception proper. And that's, that's what the, here you can see uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about demolishing uh, the border between perception and cognition. So we continuously rely on things we know uh, in order to um, draw conclusion or at least predictions and expectations about what's coming next or what is it in front of us. So even if I show you things that you haven't seen before, I'm not sure if I sh showed this uh, slide here before, but you look at an object that you've never seen, you've never seen this specific object in your life. But we, I, I, I'm sure that no, nobody here has a problem understanding what this object is. And not only this, I'm sure it's a little bit stretch here, but think, I think it's still going to work if I ask you what this collection of pixels are. I think most, if not all of you, would know that this is the cup holder, right? So you look at this collection of pixels that you've never seen in, in your life, and you have no problem understanding what it is, what's the function, you can imagine it in different situations, you can imagine it from different, from different standpoints and viewpoints, 
So I think it's pretty amazing that we can look at something that we've never seen before, but by this in, uh, connection with, with our experience, with our memory, uh, can, can uh, uh, draw conclusion, come up with interpretations, and sometimes also in, in uh, interpersonal relations we can already come up with some uh, guesses and some uh, assumptions about the personalities and, and other, other traits of what is in front of us. So we put these ideas in a, in a very simple uh, schema, a model here that, that really every concept here has been studied extensively. But the idea here, again, just to summarize it, is that we look at some, some input, and even if uh, we think it's a novel input, it's not that novel in the sense that we have something like it in memory. So when you think about your everyday life, when is the last thing that you, you really saw something that's completely normal, that doesn't look like anything that you've seen before? Unfortunately, these instances, you know, beyond the age of five, are pretty rare. So everything we see, even if the collection of pictures is novel, is nevertheless connected to something uh, that we've seen before. And by making this analogy, by making a connection between input and memory, we gain access to this vast amount of associations that can be translated uh, into uh, predictions. Udi, can I get the repetition back? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know if it's too cold for you. So, uh, I'll talk about these elements uh, one by one and start by talking about ana the analogies, and I won't get too deep into this. It's, uh, it's a study that I, I won't be surprised if I've uh, presented it before, but the idea here is uh, to look with fMRI at what happens in the brain when we recognize objects. That, that was my first uh, fMRI uh, study, and uh, <coughs> back then, with a, with a couple of groups, especially in Israel, I was in the States back then, but a couple of labs have uh, demonstrated the same thing about the same time, that Objects are recognized in this area, the fusiform and the LOC, uh, lateral occipital cortex. And that's nice, it was a study about recognition, so we were excited to get this, and the main, the crux of the paper was really that uh, this was the first site in the cortex <coughs> that showed uh, direct uh, relation with recognition success. So the more subjects knew uh, what the object was, the stronger the fMRI signal was. Uh, in earlier areas, more ectotopic areas, this was not the case. But this, this was uh, history. The, the, the main thing that I want to talk about here in regard to this study is that we also found our prefrontal activation. So again, if, if cognition and perception are separated, why would this high-level area of prefrontal cortex be active for something that's so perceptual, uh, such as understanding what objects are? So this, this kind of captivated our imagination. We, we could uh, think about two main alternative explanations for why is the prefrontal cortex be active in recognition. One of them speaks to the traditional view that, again, we have this ventral pathway, a hierarchy of increasing complexity, increasing receptive field, so that the input image hits the primary visual cortex, and this information is being analyzed in a hierarchical manner until recognition is accomplished somewhere here in the fusiform or in the inferior temporal cortex. And once recognition is accomplished, this information is projected forward to the prefrontal cortex, this big executive part, highly cognitive part of the cortex to, to tell it, okay, it's an umbrella, go do with it whatever you want, plan to take an umbrella with you, don't take an umbrella, expect rain, or whatever high level stuff uh, the the cortex would do. The alternative explanation that uh, we wanted to explore was that actually this activation that we found in object recognition played an active role in the act of recognition. That it's not being active only once recognition is accomplished, but rather is active earlier on and, uh, and supports recognition from the beginning. And I'm reminding you that functional MRI has a relatively poor temporal resolution. It's really good in, in spatial resolution, but temporal resolution is pretty lousy. Therefore, we could not distinguish between these two with the fMRI. We had to do this uh, with MEG. I don't think I'm showing you uh, this here. Uh, but the idea here was to demonstrate or to study, and we afterwards demonstrate that this activation actually started before recognition was accomplished, and this was supporting, well, not proving, but supporting um, the, the notion that it might actually play an active role, kind of sending down predictions. And how would this uh, send predictions to the ventral pathway? This is a high-level uh, area. So the basic uh, idea here is very simple. The idea here is that there are low spatial frequencies, so, so the visual scene around you consists of various uh, spatial frequencies. There are the low, the high, the, the middle, right? So low spatial frequency we know exists, uh, is, is available in the cortex somewhat earlier than the high spatial frequency. And you can ask yourself, you know, what is this blurred image going to help me with? 
But if you think about the, the recognition, uh, uh, the problem of recognition as comparing the inputs with the tens of thousands of objects that you have in memory, this is a pretty tough computational problem going through this library. So anything that can short, shortcut this, this process uh, will be welcome. And you see that this low spatial frequency, even if it's a lousy picture, nevertheless it limits uh, the, the, possible, the possible interpretations of the input significantly. So this thing could be maybe a gun, a hair dryer, a drill. And over the, the years when I've been showing this slide, I've, I've been given you know, two, three more uh, uh, possible uh, interpretations of this law, but basically you, you're down from tens of thousands of possibilities to just a hand, handful of them. So okay, then what's the difference in terms of time? Do you think that the low spatial frequency is earlier than the higher? Right. So this what are we talking about? Between 50 to 100 milliseconds. Yes, but but you know, know like parvo versus magnum. Exactly, magnum versus parvo. We have studies where we bias the stimuli to be more magnum oriented. I won't show you this here because I want to get to the newer stuff. But uh, we have studies where we bias the stimuli to, both to be more uh, isoluminant. You know that that the appeal more to the magnum versus parvo. We show the same activation. Yeah. So we're pretty confident that this is mediated by by magnum stellar uh, cells. <coughs> and maybe, maybe dorsal pathway. So the idea here is, again, in a schematic uh, way, that in addition to this good old ventral pathway that analyzes high spatial frequencies and does this in a very uh, systematic manner, we have this quick and dirty or quick and coarse uh, projection of low spatial frequencies from early stages, and we're not even sure that it's from V1. It actually could be subcortical from NGN, goes directly to the prefrontal cortex. And there somehow, and we can't be specific at this point, but we have a lot of supporting evidence that somehow prefrontal cortex uses this rudimentary information to activate a very limited set of interpretations. And this limited set of interpretation can have this process converge uh, much more efficiently. Yes. So you're suggesting that the associations are in the visual space here. What do you mean? In what? actual physical visual space, there's some similarities that go under the hair right, or right. whatever. Yes. Which are pretty low, pretty low level of things. Uh-huh. Yes. So what's the role of the prefrontal so, mechanism? Right. So we have, we have uh, it, it's still, as I said the initial, in the beginning of this, uh, talking about this slide, I won't be able to be specific. This is still an open question of what type of representations are there in prefrontal cortex. But to our surprise, and, and this is a study that I won't show you today, we found that, that low spatial versus high spatial frequencies activate prefrontal cortex differently. So you would expect that something so visual, so low level, the spatial frequencies will be limited to visual cortex, but we found that low spatial, the same picture, low spatial versus high spatial, activate differently. But interestingly, if we just showed the borders of low spatial frequency, they didn't activate the prefrontal cortex. So this is not, we're not claiming this is a replica of visual cortex, but rather, it has to be meaningful in some way, so low spatial, but at the same time, you can generate predictions based on it. And so low spatial frequency of the core doesn't give you enough to, to generate predictions. So as I said, there's, a, there's maybe like 10 or 15 papers that we have uh, by now, others also, uh, that converge to the conclusion or to the suggestion still that this uh, area, uh, this prefrontal area, plays some central role in recognition, and we suggest that it has to do with the generation of predictions. And again, I can tell you more about this afterwards, if, if there will be time or we can email it. But the thing is that objects in our environment do not appear in isolation, like the pipe that I showed you, right? So objects in our environment really appear embedded within others, other objects in the same scene. And luckily or not, but our scene or the, our environment has this typical arrangement, typical scene, typical context. So, so a pillow usually, not always, it's a, it's a matter of probabilities, but uh, a pillow usually appears on a, on a mattress or on a bed, right? And there's a carpet would be on the floor. Uh, a beach umbrella would be next to a beach chair. And so you can say that this is maybe a 0.2% chance, that 0.2 or 20% chance that this would be on the beach scene, but this would be maybe 85%. So if I tell you a beach scene or a bedroom, you activate these different objects to different degrees. But in any event, the fact that they appear together, what we call statistical regularities, can be taken uh, into account in representation and in activation, and, the, and, and we can benefit from these regularities. The fact that uh, microwaves occur in most often in kitchens 
help us expect microwaves when we enter a kitchen and help us not need to analyze this black blob under the corner of our in, in the periphery because we know what to expect and kind of we label it more easily based on our expectations. So uh, we studied a little bit, uh, we also have a series of, stu of papers on this topic of, but I just tell you the basic that how is it or where is it that, that the brain activates this uh, contextual associations, things that occur together that afterwards can afford the generation of predictions. So, in the basic paradigm, what we did with the Lisa Eminov, who is now in Carnegie Mellon, was to uh, generate or collect items, and we had, you know, we invested a lot of effort in equating these objects in every, mo in every possible dimension you can think of. And the basic difference between the objects in this group and in this group is that these objects are very diagnostic of a specific context, right? So you see a roulette wheel, you think casino, you think a blackjack, you think all the things that you can expect in a casino, or bowling alley, or you see a construction site, a construction head, you think construction site, or village people if you're old enough then, if you're, and you know this man. But basically the idea here is that each one of them is strongly associated with a specific context and as a result can allow you to activate very unique, very concrete <coughs> associations. Unlike these objects that are just you know, as familiar, as uh, frequent in our environment, as colorful, anything that you can think of, but they are not strongly associated with a specific context. And we found this medial network that's strongly activated every time we show. So we compare here, you know, MRI, FMRI, you subtract objects from object or, or condition from condition. So when you subtract strongly contextual items from weakly contextual items, you find this strong uh, uh, media network that's active uh, for the more uh, associative, the more contextual uh, items. Okay? So, so we call this contextual network, but, but uh, we don't really know what, exactly, what it does exactly. It's more that <coughs> it just keeps coming up when we show things that are highly contextual. And again, you sub subtract objects from objects. It's not that uh, there's any, any major difference here. And all these stimuli, by the way, and the, and the paradigm uh, are, are available online. People have been using them. You can download if you're interested ever to play around with this thing. So we found this contextual network that, uh, that helped us push uh, things that I actually started when I was doing my master's still in Israel with Shimon Ullman, where we did, we call this context, context frames. So context frames, the memory structure you can think of, that capture environmental regularities learned with experience, as I just said. Uh, that include identities and sometimes relations. We know that the laptop will be on top of the, uh, on top of the table and not underneath. So this typicality of relations, of special relations, can also help us with, uh, you know, if you have to search for keys in, in, when you enter a living room, you won't be looking at this part of the street, right? So expectations of, of, about where things tend to occur help us uh, optimize our, our perception our and our interaction with the environment. Uh, these context frames, as we call them, acti are activated rapidly by preliminary information in the image, like either key objects or global features. So the same way I showed you this blurred gun, I can show you also blurred things. And again, I think it's pretty powerful. If you pause for a second and say, look, look at it, this is just garbage. But if I ask you what is this collection of pixels, I bet all of you would know that this is a, a car, right? So very low level information, and nevertheless we know what it is. Right? And the, the moment we know what it is, it might sound clear, but the moment we know what this collection of pixels is, we know uh, uh, how to behave around, how to interact. And these are uh, pictures, uh, demonstrations from um, Odo Liva, Antonio Trump, and Philip Schinz. We did similar things and playing with the same object appearing in different contexts and it's being labeled differently depending on what, what are the objects around it. So again, the same collection of pixels uh, being given <coughs> different interpretations. And the idea here is that this contextual association, if we store them in these frames or whatever uh, they might be called at the end, uh, we, co we store them associatively uh, and activate them associatively, then seeing one can help us uh, understand and recognize the other faster. And indeed, in some uh, basic <coughs> demonstrations of what we call contextual priming, so you all know what repetition priming is. If I show you a chair and I measure your reaction time, I show you the same chair again, you'll be recognizing it faster because Priming, right? But here we show that uh, the same can happen also with, with the contextual priming. So if we sh if this cow, the savage that saw this cow after they saw the barn that was contextually related to it, recognized the, the, the cow significantly faster than the that saw that exactly the same cow but it was preceded by something that was contextually unrelated to it. So you have a behavioral demonstration that actually seeing one object doesn't activate only the representation of this object that's in front of you, 
but rather there's some sort of spread activation that also uh, fires up the representations of objects that are likely to be there because of these regularities that uh, I mentioned to you. So basically, uh, we, we see how the brain can, can take uh, these single objects and look at associations based on what's in memory and, and, and activate sets of expectations and what to do with it depends on the situation and, and many other things. I'm not saying that uh, now that we see traffic lights, we look for all these things, but they help us understand our environment faster and allocate our resources in a more efficient manner. <coughs> So I, I call this a proactive brain, and I mentioned before the fact that the brain is not reactive, but rather constantly trying to anticipate, trying to think how can I use my knowledge, my experience, my memory, in order to know what's next and to understand my environment in a more efficient, in the most efficient manner. So we're claiming that, that the brain does this all the time, uh, and, and so associative processing and the generation of predictions are integral processes of default activity in the proactive brain. So we continuously, by default, Doing this. Unless we're really uh, busy with something specific, uh, uh, what the claim is that we're uh, constantly busy generating predictions. The brain does this all the time. So, uh, if generating predictions is a continuous, proactive default operation of the brain, and it relies on associative activation, it is said that predictions are actually a result of associative activation, then one needs to show that associative activation is a continuous default process of human thought. So how do we see that really bra uh, the brain activates these associations and these predictions by default? And support for this came from an unexpected uh, direction. At about the same time that we've, developed, we've been developing these ideas, something uh, even more powerful became uh, popular in cognitive neuroscience, and that's the concept of default network that I'm sure some of you, if not all, have heard about. And the idea here is that there is a, a pretty significant cortical network that's very active uh, when we're not busy with something very specific and very demanding. So if you have to fly an F-15 or operate on a, on a patient or do something that's really consuming everything that, that you got, uh, you have uh, uh, some mental, some cognitive re uh, uh, reserve that can be allocated to other things. And especially when you're not busy with anything at all. You're just sitting in your car so you're stuck in traffic um, and, and, or in a shower and you're just thinking, right? So we tend to think that this thought process is very random and it just goes from all over to all over and then there's nothing consistent about it. This is partly true, but the interesting thing is that this network that's active, where we're not doing anything other than just thinking uh, randomly or spontaneously, is very consistent. It's consistent across tasks, across subjects, across continents, across routes, across everything you want. It's a giant network that's vigorously active when we're not supposed to be doing anything. So the implicit assumption of people who've been doing fMRI at the beginning, in the early days, is that in between uh, conditions when there's rest, uh, the brain just goes to sleep. There's just off period, right? But when people start looking at, at what happens in the brain in between these conditions, we see that it's very active, and not only that it's very active, it's consistently active. It's the same network that's active when we're not busy in between. So, first of all, I'm not sure you're not thinking in meditation, but uh, maybe you're thinking, you're thinking <laughs> less, you're thinking less, or you're thinking less consciously. Not not right, exactly. So, may, I mean, some of it might be non conscious, but yes, there are people, it's a good intuition. People have been studying meditators and the report network, and as far as I know, the activity there is uh, less distributed and more synchronized. Okay, so it's, it's more significant, but also during sleep, uh, people find differences, and some I'm not completely fluent in this literature, but I think the main finding in during sleep is that the same big nodes are active, but they are not as connected. So the communication between them uh, it deteriorates during sleep. And as you might have uh, noticed already, there is a striking overlap between <coughs> this default network, and you see the outlines of the default network here, of what we're doing when we're not doing anything, and our contextual activation that we suggest is directly related to predictions. So basically what it means is that when we're not doing anything and we're just thinking spontaneously, a lot of our thinking is highly associative and highly predict and has to do with predictions. Which is, might, you know, once, once you hear this, it's not that surprising because a lot of what we do is planning, right? What are we going to do after this talk? What are we going to do when we get home? Uh, how will I ask my next question? Thinking, so you always think about the future. It's much less 
uh, about the past, and when you think about the past, interestingly, it's very often in order to generate the future, in order to generate predictions. So people have shown that uh, uh, patients have hard time and, and dementia patients, for example, have hard time thinking about the future. And when you take healthy individuals and put them in the magnet, these are not our studies. You put them in the magnet and you ask them to think about the situation in the past, and you ask them to imagine a, situ a similar situation in the future, and you see a lot of overlap in the networks that are activated when we think about the past and think about the future, uh, uh, which uh, help us um, push forward this, this idea that actually this network, even though it relies and connects continuously to hippocampus and other memory structures, uh, it nevertheless has to be future-oriented. It thinks about the future in terms of generating predictions and being proactive. This is another uh, depiction of the overlap between this contextual network that we uh, charted and the default network. So, uh, associative processing, <coughs> as I said before, the generation of predictions are integral processes of default activity in the proactive brain. So, we call it proactive in the sense that it's really been our belief that the brain is continuously generating, always thinking about the future. You're called because of me, I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> How far is that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, give you my <laughs> Okay, so... Uh, Lower your thermostat. My thermostat? I can take it, but sure. <laughs> I, probably, I need to compensate you guys for some of my <laughs> being like I want to. So, um, but if somebody has a spare jacket for this lady here, yeah, this would be... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's a proactive... Uh, and so the last couple of years, uh, this method, we kind of tone down uh, the, the conviction of the brain always, always, always uh, is proactive. Always, always, always trying to think what's next, what's next. And, and, the, and the way uh, we, we get to expand on this is from this debate or this tension. It's not debate actually, it's debate in the brain, but not between people. I think that uh, researchers agree with this, and if you're not familiar with these terms, I'll explain it in a moment and you realize that you might know uh, this tension uh, in other terms. But this, this issue of exploration versus exploitation. Yes. So what mm -hmm. happens when you are daydreaming and suddenly you are surprised by an event in the reality? So I think that uh, it's very rare that you're daydreaming and just disconnect completely <coughs> from the environment. I think that if dangerous things happen or things that are very strong emotionally, you would notice them and you'll be detached from. So I think if something important happens, uh, uh, you will notice, but it's still a very striking phenomenon. I mean, daydreaming can be extremely uh, encompassing and, and ca captivating. I still remember it before I got interested, well, one of the triggers for being interested in these issues was I was sitting in a second row in some James Bond movie that was really exploding. And this is in the US, I should people go to the theater, you know, they don't uh, download the movies. So uh, I sit in the theater, this amazing stereo system, and then the screen is just in front of me, and they're starting a race with the snowmobile, and they're just starting it, and I go somewhere with my brain, you know, and, I, and I come back up back to the screen. Too much, like I've been staring at the screen, and I'm sitting there for two or three minutes, and I see these guys who are chasing each other, sitting on the bar drinking. Like, How did they get there? And there's all this explosion, and all this speed, and all this noise, and, and vision, and sight, and, and, and sound, you can, you can block yourself out. So attention is a very strong thing and daydreaming could actually be very powerful. But, uh, but I don't think, I think it's very rare to be completely oblivious to, to what's uh, uh, happening outside your uh, internal life. So uh, I'll bring, I'll bring the, the conversation of the, of the, of the presentation uh, gradually into this issue of exploration and exploitation with the topic I, I would like to end with. So, uh, we were not, obviously, as you know, we're not the only ones to think about predictions. Uh, Thali, well, unfortunately, I'm uh, disappointed with my uh, delay here, worse on this, and then other people also work on predictions, and, uh, and, and, uh, and maybe one of the most dominant uh, framework for thinking about predictions, and, and mathematically formalized, uh, so to speak, is what's called predictive coding. And predictive coding is a little more formal. I kind of did a lot of handware, it's a psychologist version of, of a model, but, uh, uh, but people have been taking this more you know, rigorously mathematically and thinking about the basically the same ideas. Not completely, I find myself uh, uh, disagreeing with, uh, with, this, uh, with this cult a little bit, but, uh, but basically we all think that, that the brain thinks about the future. 
and, and ge generates predictions. So here the idea here is that the brain generates predictions to be compared against the input. So you generate prediction, you see something, you generate prediction, you get uh, um, the input and you, sub you subtract one from the other and from this you calculate the prediction error. You say this is the correct prediction error. And then you iterate, you change your prediction, you modify your prediction until this and with, this, with the iterations, this uh, prediction error is zero, right? So you just, a very engineering kind of model, you go with loops until you minimize this error to be zero. And once it's zero, close to zero, then your prediction is the perception, right? So it's, it's equal, because you modify your prediction to, to match perfectly uh, the input. So prediction error, in, in a way, the prediction minus the sensory input, or the top-down uh, minus the bottom-up. So according to these people, and I've been hanging out with a lot of uh, people like Carl Fristol and others who have been championing this, uh, I invited the same talk, the same uh, workshops, and then I say I deviated a little bit so they might stop inviting me, but the idea there is that uh, mathematically speaking, they immediately think about, okay, what does the brain want to optimize? Thinking about the brain as, as a computer in a way, there's one thing that it wants to optimize, it wants to minimize prediction error, right? Minimizing prediction, prediction error means no surprise. It's that you're striving for minimal amount of surprises in your life. You just look for the familiar and the less surprising, uh, so you have maximum certainty, right? So you, you, you know what's coming next, and this mode we can call exploitation. You exploit what you're already familiar with. It's like enjoying the routine of, uh, of uh, you know, coming back home after an exhaustive day. You don't want surprises, you want certainty, you know, you know exactly what's waiting for you at home, more or less, and you want to enjoy it. So there's nothing wrong with routine, there's nothing wrong with exploiting the familiar, but our brain is not always in this moment. Because if this is the only thing we try to do, then we can learn, right? We, we learn from prediction errors that are not zero, right? When we predict something and we're surprised, or when we can predict because it's too novel and what we see is completely new. We have to update our memory uh, uh, storage so that we, next time we can generate prediction about these things. So there's less exploration because you remain on the same, on the same topic, on the same focus, on, on things that are familiar to you. There's less novelty in your environment and, and the no fun thing is that uh, uh, I have joking here, but I'll get uh, more serious about it when we talk a little bit about mood later on. So should we minimize surprise or maximize novelty? And now you see that if you are if you're, uh, dogmatic about predict the predictive coding uh, uh, model, then you, and you want to know does the brain optimize or minimize surprise or, or maximize novelty? Do we like surprise or do we not like surprise? And I think the answer is, and it's pretty intuitive, I don't think uh, many people would disagree, is that we flip. That our brain or our mind is not always in the same state. When we land in a foreign town, we go to travel to uh, Peru that we haven't been there before, we're not looking for falafel, right? We're looking for what the local people be, you know, can we explore something, let's learn something new, because we're in a more exploratory mode. But when we, again, return home uh, after an exhaustive day, we don't want to explore, we want to exploit the familiar and the uncertainty of the familiarity or the certainty of the familiar. So the brain, uh, 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 I, I think, uh, struggles or, or there's this tension between exploration and exploitation and I don't want to, uh, to uh, come across as arguing that we either exploiting or exploring. It's a continuum, it's a spectrum and, and we, we, we're always uh, uh, sliding somewhere along this, this, uh, this spectrum. Uh, so a lot of a lot has been said about exploration and exploitation before we discovered this. For us it was more like a revelation of Let's tone down the brain is proactive and it's always, always generating predictions, generating predictions. It still might always generate predictions, but uh, it could affect our mode of exploration versus exploitation might affect what we generate predictions on and do we choose to be in an environment where we're likely to generate the correct predictions versus no environment where we're welcoming, so to speak, uh, high prediction error. But people have been studying, especially computationally, people like Peter, Diana, Jonathan Cohen and others, uh, identifying the neurotransmitters that are involved and then one interesting topic is how do we flip? Is, is this just a spontaneous thing that we become more exploratory versus exploitatory? Or is it something that happens uh, voluntarily? Or is it something that we can control? And as I'll say in a second, there are some psychiatric disorders that might be characterized by more dwelling on exploration versus more dwelling on, on exploitation. So these are issues that are interesting and, and very much still uh, open questions. 
So uh, one of the, the directions in our lab now is to study how is it that uh, the relation between more top down, the bias and the, and, and the kind of uh, the balance between more uh, uh, top down versus more bottom up and how is this related? Can we rela rely sometimes more top down versus on bottom up? And you mentioned meditation before. So I think that in meditation it's more, this is one case where it's mostly bottom up and we kind of shutting off uh, the, the top down as much as we can. Whereas in other cases, uh, like in mind wandering, that's the, the opposite, uh, we're doing uh, just, you know, we don't, we almost ignore completely the input and we're just relying on what's coming from the inside. It's more uh, uh, top down and more exploratory mode. And that's uh, primarily work that we're pushing now with Amir Tal, um, who is a student in the lab. And he's, what place is there? He's here. He's not here today. Okay. So you see the student here, I think. Uh, same last name, okay. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, the, the, and, and, as I said before, do we consciously decide to switch from one to the other, etc. So there are some important applications that I'm just selecting here, some random ones that, that are uh, of interest to us, but I'm sure you can uh, you find yourself many others. One of them, as I said, the brain continues to generate predictions as much as it can, but whether we're in exploratory mode or exploitatory mode, whether we're open to novelty and to new experiences, whether we would like to exploit familiar situation uh, would affect what we'd like to approach and what we'd like to avoid. So you enter a cocktail party and in certain mood you'll be just walking around to people you don't know and introduce yourself and, and talk to them, whereas in other moods you just you know, look for somebody familiar and you stick with them for the rest of the event. So uh, that's just a simple uh, basic uh, demonstration of approach versus avoid. In other cases, or another other important implication is uh, you can call it creativity, even though this is a charged uh, topic and people have studied with different uh, approaches, but creativity in the sense that uh, when you're creative, there's a mental freedom to roam. You know, you jump from, from one thought to another, you're more associative, and in a sense, uh, uh, there's, if you can think about it as inner exploration. So I talked about behavior being exploratory versus exploitatory, but also your thought process can be uh, very broad, very exploratory versus uh, uh, exploitatory, like being stuck on the same topic. And the question is whether a uh, mental load, uh, whether uh, when you're loaded with, with stuff to do mentally, cognitively, uh, uh, it forces you to exploit more than to explore. Just like when you're very busy, if you're rushing to catch a bus, you don't really explore the environment and, and notice the flowers on the way because you're running to the bus and you're kind of goal-oriented and you're loaded with some needs and some actions that, that you need to perform. So similarly, internally, you can, can have the same dialogue there and when you're uh, mentally loaded, uh, uh, it, it drives you to be more exploratory. So in a set of studies uh, led by uh, Shia Baron, I want to make sure you know how she looks, so that's another picture, and she sits there. And the idea there was uh, deceivingly simple. The idea here was uh, let's try three associations like we do in psychoanalysis. You know, you just give people a word and you ask them to give a response as quickly as possible. Okay, so they, they give, you say uh, shoe, they say sock, you say meal, they say cow. Okay, so the first thing that comes to mind. But, it, but, it, but the nice thing that the Shira did here was to load their, uh, their working memory to different degrees. So either they are just and, and you know, all, uh, you, everybody here I'm sure knows what's working memory and how to load it, but basically we either give them a, a very short string of numbers to remember before the task, and then they have to speed it out afterwards so that we know they actually maintain it in memory, otherwise they exclude this trial. Or we load their memory with a long string, and again, uh, they have to maintain this in memory. That's a high load, and, 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 and once we, we kind of teach them what they need to remember, we give them this three association task, okay? So the idea here is to see if you're more loaded, if you're more busy rehearsing and thinking about something specific, how will it affect your, the breadth and the exploratory nature of the responses that you'll be providing at the experimenter. And we found that uh, according to this uh, story that I've been telling here, when subjects were highly loaded, or loaded with a stronger, uh, with a longer string of numbers, they provided uh, less variety. They were more consistent. They were more, there was more consensus across subjects. Let me give you an example of what I mean. 
So if the world was white and people had to give a different, different subject, people had to give a response, a free association response to the world white, the subjects that were loaded with a, a short string were more diverse, in a way you can say more creative. People gave, provided different names, whereas there was more consensus in the high load. So when they were given uh, a high string of a long string of numbers to remember, they were more consensual. They gave the most immediate, the most obvious uh, um, uh, association. What is really intriguing here uh, is that why is it in the low case? Uh, you can also you can also provide the shortest path, but few people choose, and with equal reaction time, they choose to go broader and to be more exploratory in a way. In their sense, in their sense. Yes. There's no. That I, you see, you're holding your question and working on memory. <laughs> That's why I didn't give an equal reaction time with equal. Yes. Yeah, so I have a question. I realize you. We have large working memory. <laughs> Is it across subjects or across the petition within subject, the subject? Subject, across. So this is one subject, another subject. And these are, these are good questions, and it, indeed it would have been uh, it, it would have been still interesting if, if people in this condition uh, took more time and were more creative. And we're studying now that she has a PhD thesis work. Um, to what extent actually, when they provide a very creative or broader, not the immediate. Do they still activate this but provide the other one? Well, there are different and, and just you know, think about what would be the underlying mechanism that if there's a, an easier, shorter, stronger association, why go further? The same way if you can ask if I can just uh, spend there's this debate with the predictive coding, people talk about the, the dark, the, the uh, cat in a dark room. If you, know, if you try to minimize surprise, just stay in a dark room, there's no input, there's no stimulation spend the rest of your life with zero surprises. But people still choose to venture out of their uh, familiar and you know, the, the But you think there's a trade-off here. If you were telling the uh, subjects to report as fast as possible, they would go for the black, 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 for the white, right? But, but as I just answered, uh, uh, our guy... Uh, because they did not do explicitly to try to limit the time. Or no, they, they, they have to respond as quickly as possible. That's, that's you're right that we can do a follow-up experiment. What was the average reaction time share? Was it two seconds, half a second, two seconds? But we can say, you know, uh, you have a bell after 500 milliseconds. That's, that's on our agenda, you know, just a response we you know, right? Just respond within the next 700 milliseconds, whatever comes. Because we're interested to know if in this case where they're more creative, were they just creative to impress Shira, or was it that because you know they chose to go there, they're receiving more endorphins because they choose something that's less less frequent, less so it's less than cells. What that? It's less than cells. It's possible, possible. yeah. So, but the question is, and that's that why time. That, that's why we said we are curious to see if also in this creative case, where uh, a subject that activated a dress, for example, did they also activate black? Because it was, you know, it's like a heavy uh, association, just connected so strongly, but provided this, or it only activated this, both cases would be interesting. So it takes a longer time to be created? No, now it's the same amount of time. Yeah, but we did. Yeah. No, no, so it, it seems to me that you said to people, okay, respond as fast as you can. Right. But the pe people that uh, were in slow mode, in leisure and, uh, so reaction time, time here, reaction time here was equivalent. But okay. the question is if we really put pressure on them and say not two seconds, respond in seven hundred milliseconds and let's see what happens then. Okay? And now the first thing we wanted to see though is uh, this is a fresh uh, set of sites. We're not we haven't published it yet, but the uh, analysis is pretty much final here. But the idea there is this the only kind of load. I mean can we say that working memory is the home of creativity and uh, so we decided to do some other cognitive load that it's not that it's not working memory like alphabetizing uh, strings and, and after we found the same effect here we said okay let's take not cognitive load but perceptual load and here we played with color uh, uh, distinctions and again we found that no matter perceptual or cognitive or working memory or not working memory in all cases when they're busy with something uh, so what what were they busy with in this case they had to de report. Uh, that they look for any any letter in red or green L. So this is like the low load and the high load. What? Okay. Go ahead. Oh, we have to turn on the... Will you survive if they turn on No, no, he wants to... Yeah. Wants to do it because he has to... Yeah, well, that's rush. Okay. So, uh, 
No, I, I can stop here. I mean, what, if, if we need to, uh, what's that? Five more minutes. So I just tell you that uh, we've, tie, we've been tying this also recently uh, to the issue of mood. I know it's a little unexpected, but uh, we're thinking that mood is a function of associative thinking. So the broader you, you think, the happier or the more positive your mood is. And the, the crux of this hypothesis is that mood is directly linked to how associative or inhibited are our mental processes. And that's a whole separate talk that I won't be giving here. I'll just tell you there is a publication that, uh, or two that, that uh, I can also direct you to. And there's a host of converging evidence that, that uh, or circumstantial evidence, I'll call it, that support this counterintuitive uh, 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 hypothesis. That actually what we're arguing and we're studying with healthy individuals and, and, and with uh, depressed people, I'll just show you a little bit. The hypothesis here is that people in depression uh, that we know ruminate, I know they're stuck in, in, in one topic and they go on and on and on and on. It's possible that this is a result of too much inhibition potentially coming from the media prefrontal cortex uh, compared with a healthier brain that higher social needs still some inhibition. You know, if you don't have inhibition at all, you might develop hallucination and schizophrenia. But, but we, we need some healthy level of inhibition, but not too much inhibition. So uh, within the, this realm, uh, we can actually be uh, more creative and think more broadly. And as I said before, you can, you can look at all these studies, including extreme cases where deep brain stimulation is, is being uh, implanted exactly in the same area where we find associative activation. So there's some encouraging things to do there. So to do this with healthy individuals, just to check this uh, uh, potential the potential uh, implications even for potential therapy in the, in the future. What we did uh, with Maria Mason, who's a faculty in Colombia now, uh, was to emulate ruminations. So people either looked at a uh, sequence of words that uh, are uh, surrounding the same topic or expanded. So they were both associative, but here the associations stuck around the same topic, and here they expanded and they were like uh, akin to broad associations. And we found that uh, this manipulation improved mood when the words that they were reading were advancing broadly, uh, their mood according to the whatever, uh, uh, this is not a great measurement, but that's what uh, we learned existed in these communities, it's called the PANAS, uh, we found significant improvement in mood as a result of just reading words. So the words are neutral emotionally, it's not happy words versus sad words. We're just talking about the nature of thinking, the pattern of thinking, uh, is different between people in good mood and bad mood. And that's not depression yet, though. We, we're doing the same thing here uh, in depression, but when I uh, moved back to Israel, we translated these things, and it happens also with Israeli uh, students. The same thing, that we play with all these associative games, and we found uh, improvement in, uh, in mood as a result of broad, the breadth of association. So thinking broadly versus thinking narrowly can directly affect uh, your mood. So I'll just end here by say, by summarizing, perception relies on existing knowledge as much as it does on incoming information. So there's this interplay between memory and, and the senses, and there's input and, and bottom up and, and top down. By answering the what is it like question, our proactive brain generates predictions that facilitate perception, cognition, and action. Our, bra our proactive brain is not always proactive. That's just a part of the exploration explanation. So. Uh, these are the different generations of my lab. This was still in the US. And some of the, of the studies I showed were already uh, coming here from, uh, from uh, maybe from Shia. So I thank you very much for your attention and sorry again for my uh, uh, um, being late. And you are welcome to come here. Thank you very much. Cortex, right. but it's a big, a big role in this, in this and uh, I saw different names here. So sometimes it's prefrontal cortex, sometimes it's orbital frontal or media prefrontal. So I was just wondering how tight this frontal cortical area is across this. Right. So some of the reasons for this. Uh, for this uh, different terminology is that different domains of these studies are activating different regions. So in the recognition part, it was more orbital frontal, the other in the context one, it was more uh, medial prefrontal. Uh, and part of the reason that I'm using different names is because I don't want to commit to a specific one, because this, again, these studies keep on 
people. So we have to zero in, and I don't want to commit to specific coordination for this thing is completely. But it, I won't be surprised if different subsections there do different things related to predictions. I think, I think since we started with the uh, uh, see my mind is uh, <laughs> stuck in the same uh, place. Uh, but uh, when we do meditation, you mentioned that we block the top down, that we block the inside and allow the outside to go. And I think it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, you asked the question. Uh, the thing is that I think the, the, the real thing in meditation, and I don't, I'm not professional, but I do it quite a bit, is to allow your, uh, your inner model, as I call them, your, uh, mm -hmm. what did you call it, your, your past, your, your inner world, to flow <coughs> free, as free as possible, and you don't allow any of the ideas that you have to stay with you, and you don't allow it to circle around. So I like this very much because this is really the manifestation of between depression and being free. Mm -hmm. And meditation helps you to get rid of this going around the circles and allow the free flow to flow without interruption of the outside world, mm -hmm. without the mm -hmm. So I would say it's the opposite. It's the the resting network that is allowed to wander around its uh, scale, but not in this way, in that way, in this way. Yeah, but first of all, what you're saying definitely supports the, the fact that people with depression are sometimes prescribed to try meditations, because meditation for, which is uh, for other reasons. This is your heart. <laughs> and, and, uh, and no, but it's more that I had much less experience with neurosis. I only I took one retreat that is where this beard started to grow uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago, a week of uh, silence retreat, and just I wanted to explore and see what, and this was my conclusion. Maybe I need more retreats to, to, <laughs> to reach your conclusion. But no, but I think this idea, I mean, at some point, at some point, I don't think they don't understand. But, you know, it's not like, into the third day I experienced what uh, this lady there was saying, I got nothing. Nothing inside. It's caught on. I need my brain back. I can't. I can't uh, have nothing that is going to. Am I going to be able to think again? So, uh, uh, so, so you, you can say, but but you know, I think that the, the whole idea. If you take the main slogan of meditation of uh, don't be judgmental. I think don't be judgmental means don't generate, don't anticipate anything through your environment, and don't and, and let it more you know come to you. Rather than uh, seriously, why did you say you allow the inputs in? in Close the judgment that you say now because, well, because I don't know the, the whole idea. Maybe, maybe, maybe I was referring more to like you know, Buddhism in general, not the practice of meditation. Because the idea of living in the moment, being you know, noticing the flowers and all these things, I think uh, what we uh, our big sin is to, to be engaged in this daydreaming while we do, you know, uh, uh, while I'm playing with my kids, they think about work, then I miss you know, things that happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any cross individual studies relating food, like big flying food, to general sensitivity? Like some people seem to stick more to it, and some people seem to be happier. So there is a, there is actually the opposite link. I, I usually uh, read after I think so. I read about this after I had you know, the ideas of movement association. It turns out there's a lot of literature in psychology, especially in social psychology, maybe clinical psychology, that shows the other direction, which means that people in good mood are more associative. Okay, so people in good mood tend to some interesting paradigms, one called RAP, remote association type. So got some kind of measure of creativity. So people in, in more positive mood would generate more remote associations, the less likely associations. Whereas, uh, uh, so, so this area, but we argue also the opposite, that if we can make people more associative, we can also improve their mood, and we have some initial uh, evidence for this. Yes? I can't hear you. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned that you can Right. Yeah. 
Well, first of all, you make me uh, realize I use the word creativity maybe two more t more times than I meant to. I meant to mention it only once and briefly because we don't study creativity and this this literature is a, is a mess. I think you know, what happened in the study of creativity. It's very interesting uh, topic, but there's all kind of uh, research on this, and I'm definitely not studying creativity proper. We don't. That's not what we do. We study the breadth of association, and then as close as we get to talking about creativity, and we use some measurements of that. But uh, you're right that I haven't made a, an explicit link between predictions and, and creativity or associativity, but, uh, but, but the link is associativity, because we see the activation of an association <coughs> as an activation of prediction. And you can say that it still remains to be proven. So if I say chair and you think table, because they are connected in some way with an association, does it mean that it's a prediction or it's just activated, right? Because um, if I say, uh, I just say now the word Paris, some of you thought Eiffel Tower, right? But it's not like you're expecting Eiffel Tower to be somewhere around here. So maybe this associative motivation is not always uh, uh, comparable to prediction proper. So there's some link there between associations and predictions that's not completely distilled. But, but I just want to, I want to stay away from creativity proper. Well, it's inhibition from, from expanding your associations. That's the inhibition. It's not that you don't activate. I don't necessarily claim that people with depression activate less concepts, but they just are activating them within the same realm, same topic, and, and they don't expand. And I think this level of inhibition, it's a little metaphorical, but this level of inhibition prevents them from expanding their mental scope. Okay. 